Before I shift over to the lecture, I want to let you know that I'll be interspersing this video lecture with some film clips. So there are two important things. One, make sure you view the lecture in its entirety. And two, after the conclusion of the lecture, I'll have some additional words on how to negotiate writing about the film versus writing about uh, the text in our book. So make sure that you listen to that. Thank you. Welcome to the video lecture for Charlotte Perkins Gilman, The Yellow Wallpaper. And hopefully you've got your course book open uh, to The Yellow Wallpaper, and probably you should have the lecture notes, the text lecture notes for The Yellow Wallpaper as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm going to be referring to paragraph numbers, so let's get started. At paragraph two, the narrator states that romantic felicity, or marital bliss, we could call it, is too much to ask for, but she wants it. We can already ask ourselves, why happiness in her marriage is too much for the narrator to expect? What is the relationship between the narrator and her husband like? Also, from the use of first-person point of view, first-person pronouns I, me, my, surely we have a first-person narrator here. And, by the way, we should not confuse in short stories the author with the narrator. If you engage in some research over the yellow wallpaper, what you'll find is that aspects of this story compare quite well with aspects of Gilman's life. However, Gilman is not the narrator. The narrator is simply a character in the story who tells us the story. At paragraph four, why is the house empty for so long? Does the emptiness of the house relate to some possible emptiness in their marriage? Now you see, word choices are very important in fiction, in poetry and all literature as well. But we should never assume that uh, an author makes a word choice by accident. This is craft, and uh, it's crafted quite deliberately. Okay, um, paragraph five, being laughed at by one spouse. Is that expected in marriage? In, in the very short space now of five paragraphs, we're starting to form opinions about this marriage. We know that uh, romantic felicity, too much to hope for. There's an emptiness associated with the house, if not the marriage. And now, uh, her being laughed at is apparently acceptable. Okay, we move to paragraph eight. We find out that John, her husband, does not believe she's sick. She asks, what can one do? Her question suggests that she is willing to follow his edicts and it suggests a position of powerlessness on her part. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Her question will also become a refrain throughout the story. Now a refrain is most commonly a device we would find in poetry, but it is used in fiction as well, and the yellow wallpaper is a fine example of that. Paragraph 11. Take note of the, the line, so I take phosphates, moving to the line, what is one to do in paragraph 14? Now again, there's the aspect of the powerlessness of a female because she, is, she simply takes these medications that her husband prescribes. What's this? You do not have my permission, Dr. Stark, to read a word of it. I shouldn't dream of doing so. Besides, I should need a magnifying glass. Perhaps you didn't fully understand me, Sharp. Let me repeat what I told you two months ago. I cannot answer for your good health, physical or mental, unless you undertake to lay aside your writing.
Your child. Your husband. Your home cannot be laid aside. And the energy of the human body is finite. What nature expends in one direction, she must economize on in another. The young woman who makes too much intellectual effort risks decline into a delicate alien woman whose future, allow me, is more or less suffering. A lesson I should not like to see experience teach you, Charlotte. Just read him for me. And out. Hmm. I see your dressmaker has already begun to help you conceal your loss of weight. You must put on flesh, my dear. Surely I can appeal to your vanity, if nothing else. But there's nothing gravely wrong with you. I think we can reassure poor John on that point. Charming earrings, my dear. So, if there's powerlessness, what will she do to empower herself? Her outlet is writing, which is really a retreat into her own mind. Uh, she asks in paragraph 14, yet again, what is one to do? We too should ask, what is one to do? Uh, will she find a safe place other than the pages of her journal? And will this place be her own mind? At paragraph 15, she must hide her writing and obey him despite the fact that she wants to see her friends. So all the medicines and euphemisms used to describe her condition were used, euphemisms that were used for postpartum depression. And much literary criticism has been written over the narrator possibly experiencing postpartum depression. We move to paragraph 18. And the dialogue is, the most beautiful place, it is quite alone. Now, there is beauty in being alone and set off, just like retreating into her own mind. The description of the house is interesting, though, insofar as its beginning. It does sound like quite a nice place. However, as this description unfolds, there's walls, there's gates that lock, there's separate housing. In effect, the shift here uh, from this most beautiful place is from a happy setting to something that devolves into a prison-like setting. Devolve, of course, the opposite of evolve. When we think of something evolving, hopefully it's getting better by evolving. This is uh, devolving, and it's becoming a prison-like setting. When we notice uh, something in a story that makes us draw comparisons, as this description does, we should look for its reoccurrence in the story. For example, will her life become more and more like the life of a prisoner? So we've made this connection. It's it's prison-like in this one particular image. Let's, as we read, look for anything else we can attribute to a, a prison-like setting or environment. I would not see this to a living soul, of course, but this is dead paper and a great relief to my mind. I do sometimes wonder if one of the reasons I don't get well faster is because John is a doctor. You see, he knows there is no reason for me to suffer. And being a practical man, that satisfies him. Still, I have my notebook. And if I do only a little work each day, I'm sure I will improve. It will relieve the press of ideas that teem in my brain. Okay, we move to paragraph 24. She says she gets unreasonably angry with John sometimes. Well, perhaps her anger is indeed unfounded, but perhaps not. As readers, it's up to us to engage in the business of literary analysis. Do we see John as a caring and dutiful husband who's doing his best to take care of her? Or do we see him as manipulative and controlling? It's up to each of us to decide what our own analysis is. Um, paragraph 25. As you read through this paragraph and the ensuing paragraphs, it appears that John's control over her is intense. Move to paragraph 31. The room sounds like a prison or dungeon. Again, we have this, this prison image. 32. 
the description of the wallpaper begins here and the story is going to become rife with these type of descriptions. Moving to paragraph 34, the word choice, smoldering. Very interesting. What else could we suggest is smoldering? Um, we also have the word choice, lurid. So has her reaction to the wallpaper already smoldered into some sort of perception of gruesomeness? Usually when we think of smoldering, something is about to catch fire or explode in, in some way. So we have to wonder uh, what else is smoldering here. Paragraph 46, we have the first mention of the baby. Goes along with postpartum depression um, at paragraph 51. Again, John is either being dutiful or he's being controlling. Once again, it's up to us to decide. Paragraph 64, the shift to the use of the second person pronoun, you, could be used to jar readers by making us a bit more uncomfortable than we would be if the narrative just stayed in the first person. It's almost now by you talking directly to us. <clears throat> Pardon me. We'll move to paragraph 80. She sees John's sister on the stairs. Does this foreshadow the act of looking for a woman? Also, in looking for a woman, is this really a search for self? She's found a woman in the yellow wallpaper. Paragraph 87. She cries all the time, we are told. Depression. Postpartum depression? Perhaps. Now, for me, as someone who's read and taught this story a number of times, here's a question I struggle with. At what point are we first signaled that we may be dealing with an unreliable narrator? Perhaps it is this very paragraph. Move to 91. Here and forward, the disorder of the wallpaper's pattern seems to give her some sort of order or, or security. She has come to see the disordered pattern in the wallpaper as a safe haven. But is it a safe haven that's also destroying her? Interesting question. Move to paragraph 108 and we have the expletive, Dear John. So whom is she trying to convince? There's certainly a lot of emotion here, but does it also smack of depression? 114, what is the baby's gender? Do we know? Is it odd for a mother to be so distanced from her baby? At 121, the woman in the wallpaper is mentioned right here for the first time. So if we didn't know earlier that we have an unreliable narrator, surely we must know now. At 127, the woman wants to escape the wallpaper. What might this correlate to? Is there another woman in the story that's trying to escape something? Uh, paragraph 129. From here, through many of the ensuing paragraphs, his treatment of her is either dutiful or it's maddening. Once again, your literary analysis, up to you to decide. Paragraph 161, we're taking quite a jump there. Under what circumstances could the wallpaper stain her clothes? 
Is she physically touching the wallpaper by rubbing up against it? And even if that's the case, she says that the wallpaper has also stained her husband's clothes. How would this be possible? Are we to believe that our husband is also rubbing up against the wallpaper? Or is all of this unreliable narration? Now, paragraph 168. Um, compare paragraph 168 to paragraph 154. And in doing so, I asked the question, does she sleep or not? Paragraph 174. From here, and once again into some of the ensuing paragraphs, she has anthropomorphized the smell. That means to assign it human qualities. When you assign an inanimate object, human qualities. And here we're talking about the smell. She tells us it skulks, it creeps, and it lies in wait for her. Unreliability? Perhaps. At paragraph 182, who rubbed the smooch into the wall? Moreover, if we do not believe that her husband's clothes had smooches, are we to believe that there are any smooches at all? Okay, 192, the woman in the wallpaper gets out in the daytime like the narrator. So who is the woman in the wallpaper? Assuming that that woman is the creation of a sick mind, who then would she represent? 198. Has the narrator truly fallen into insanity at this point? What are you... What are you doing, Charlotte? What are you looking for? I'm looking at that woman. Which woman? She's here. That poor woman has been shut up here. I thought she hated me, but she had wanted to talk. Oh, darling, no! Dear God, you must know who I mean! The woman who used to wear this! Darling, that's yours. Don't you remember? I bought it for you in Rome. Rome? You, you don't look after your things. My things? Have I wasted my things. Poor dress. It's all nothing and it's spoiled. Sit down, darling. 224. Would she kill to protect the wallpaper, to protect herself? 243. She now believes that she herself came out of the wallpaper. And as we move to 262, what does, I will ask you, the final line of the story suggest? And here it might be productive to read over the last couple of paragraphs or so a number of times and try and picture in your own mind, get a handle on what is literally occurring in the final scene. Charlotte? Charlotte? Let me in, darling.
hope you enjoyed the yellow wallpaper. I hope these lecture notes were helpful. All right. The main thing that I want to make clear is that you are writing, if you choose to write about the yellow wallpaper, you're writing about the story, the written story not the movie. So don't confuse the two if you choose to write a paper over the yellow wallpaper. I included clips from the film just for your own enjoyment and to be able to get a better handle on the story itself. But there are key differences. For example, in the written short story, uh, the narrator, the main character who tells us the story in first person, the woman who's being driven mad, she doesn't have a name. And in my lecture, I I told you let's not confuse the author Charlotte Perkins Gilman with the narrator but when you turn uh, a written text into a film uh, you have to solve problems for instance the characters in the movie would they go around for the entire film never speaking uh, uh, the main character's name no so I suppose the producers the writers decided to name her Charlotte but you cannot refer to the narrator as Charlotte in your paper because we're not writing about the film we're writing about the short story itself. Um, there are other differences too. Uh, for example, there was the scene with the doctor where he puts this stethoscope on her. If you were to describe that in detail in your paper, well that really never occurs in the short story. So be very careful uh, throughout your paper if you decide to write about the yellow wallpaper to write about the text version, the story, not the film. Uh, if you were to make that mistake, start calling the narrator Charlotte. Uh, you can refer to the narrator as the narrator, the woman. Uh, just be very careful about this. Remember that you're writing about the short story, not the film. Thank you.